Good, good morning. We're on the. I'm gonna have Mr. Zimmerman here. <clears throat> Is Mr. Zimmerman not? That's what I was just going to announce. With the wrong record. Okay, we're on the record case number 12, CF 1083A. Morning, Mark. Morning. Uh, I've been pretty good in the past, but not today, about getting a written waiver from my client for his appearance today, <laughs> noting that it's just a motions only. Um, so I'll follow it up Monday with a written notice. You can inquire him Monday. But I did tell him yesterday when we left, after he waived his appearance at the trial hearing, that today was not a necessary appearance for him. I apologize for not having it in writing, but we'll clear that up Monday. That's fine. Your um, oral pronouncement will be sufficient. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Council wanted to appear today because you had some housekeeping matters you wanted to address. Yes, Your Honor. Please, the court, I did file yesterday a request to perpetuate the testimony <laughs> of a witness. Yeah, let me pull it up because I did not get one. Sarah, do you know why this isn't coming up on here? Okay, I've got it up on the computer. Thank you, Your Honor. Essentially, it is, this is, the witness is a, uh, one of the defendant's former professors at a local, a local institution and is not going to be available during the upcoming scheduled time of trial. He will be available, I think, up through Tuesday of next week. And so I had filed a request simply to perpetuate his testimony. The defendant is, at least has the opportunity to be present while that's done since it is the equivalent of courtroom testimony. I noticed it as soon as I became aware that the witness wasn't going to be available, uh, but he did, he did contact us yesterday and he's going to be absent for a lengthy period. Um, and so I, I filed the request so that his testimony can preserve. It won't be long, it won't be lengthy, it won't be detailed, um, but it needs to be preserved at this point in order for it to even, even be presented at all. Mr. O'Meara? Yes, Your Honor, I think it's a good idea that we take his deposition, as I would like to do anyway, now that it looks as though he's going to be a trial witness. Within that deposition, we can identify whether or not he truly is unavailable, such that his deposition testimony should be admitted. Well, I have it's a not deposition testimony that gets admitted. It's, it's, it would oh. be <coughs> the, <coughs> the equivalent of trial testimony. Just his deposition doesn't necessarily get admitted in lieu of. Yes, correct. Um, because I do have a concern of confrontation of the witness, particularly based upon the fact that we don't know what other witnesses will have said during the trial, that we would then be able to otherwise impeach or cross-examine him on, which we would not have that opportunity at trial with a perpetuated testimony. So I'm not agreeing to, well, here's the concern. He may say in his deposition one thing and may not address other issues because I don't know exactly what the state is going to present at trial where his testimony might be relevant. Who knows if they're going to bring him in to say he was a good student or a student who attended or didn't. I don't really know yet, but to the extent that then we are now in the middle of a trial and that that testimony comes in, I may want to have had an opportunity to cross-examine him on information that's become available through other witnesses at trial. What if, what if the state calls their first witness and 
they testify to things, and then afterwards all these other witnesses testify, and they don't call them back as a rebuttal. I mean, you have your opportunity to call them as your witness. Right. Um, and I would if I wanted to under that scenario. Under this scenario, I may not have the opportunity with this witness. That's my concern. If we have a witness who's going to give trial testimony who's not otherwise available to the defendant, I'm concerned with that. Well, he is going to be available because the motion is per to perpetuate his testimony, which means that both sides are there. It's direct examination, cross-examination, rebuttal, recross, however you want to do it, as if you were sitting here at trial testimony and that that get played to the jury. Um, that's the purpose of it. Right, and I think I mentioned my concern. My concern is that it is not dynamic within the context of the trial when my client is facing second degree murder. I, mean, I say by that this, they may have otherwise called him 10 days into the trial. I would then have 10 days of testimony available to me so that when that witness comes on the stand, I can say to him, what about this? Because witness in day two said this. I don't know that yet. Now, I understand that's an inherent concern with perpetuating testimony in all cases. I'm just not going to waive it on my client's behalf because I want to make sure he is truly not available at any period during this now two to four week trial. If he's gone for vacation for a week, fine. Fit him in somewhere else. But if he's Well, truly, they can call him first, really. Sure. And then he's live. And then... Okay. Well, then your objection is that he's not live. But, yes. you, but, but you have the opportunity to cross-examine him as if he were live, even as the first witness. Maybe the state could present whether or not he's gone for the entirety of the Well, they put in here the most. time he's going to be gone from June 24th through uh, mid-August. He does have 2012 here. I think you meant 2013. Yeah, my apologies. Yes, it, it, it's going to be a long absence, and it will encompass virtually the entire trial. Well, again, like I mentioned to begin with, I don't want to belabor the point with you. I think I've identified my concern. I think at the deposition that we take, I'll have a better feel for whether or not I've truly vetted out everything that he may otherwise testify. You're not for. taking a deposition. You're taking his Sorry. trial testimony. I, I don't mean to be informal when I say deposition. But there is a difference. In the case law, there's a big difference. Without question, I don't mean to be um, imprecise. Okay, I'm going to grant their motion to perpetuate the testimony of this particular witness. The witness a good time and, and date, um, which works for Mr. Amir. I will provide the court reporter as well as a videographer for that purpose. And uh, um, I'm sorry, just so we're clear, I want an opportunity to pose him before his trial testimony, so he'll need to be available twice, or at least he'll uh, be available the same day, and you can speak with him prior to. I, I mean, just I need an opportunity to vet through what I find out in the deposition before he does trial testimony. No objection to that, Judge, but I'll point out that the defense hasn't noticed him for deposition so far. There are 220 witnesses, my understanding. When was, he, when was he noticed as a potential witness? April, sometime in April as... April what year? Oh, this year. Okay. Okay, motion's granted. Next motion. Um, you only had a couple, so whatever order you're ready for. Good morning. The state filed a motion in limine regarding self-serving hearsay statements of the defendant. Okay. We had um, a that one. Didn't I read on? Didn't I already order rule on that one? Uh, no. <clears throat> Give me just one moment, please. I have an order that I signed on June 5th, 2013, and it's entitled Order on State's Motion in Limine Heard on May 28th, 2013. Paragraph says, one says, without objection, the following motions are granted. A, the State's Motion in Limine regarding self-serving hearsay statements of defendant. I, I'm aware of the order, Judge. I'm, I remember the hearing, and I remember how it, uh, that the, the issues were framed like this. There well, are. I've heard it, and I've done an order on it. I need a motion for rehearing on it. I don't. I don't have one. No, Your Honor, that's not accurate. I'm sorry about how this went. At the time of the hearing, when I think the court said what June fifth, and the order was June fifth. The order was June 5th, the hearing was May 28th. All right, on May 28th, I said to the court, 
that we agree with the general principle that self-serving hearsay statements of the defendant would properly be excluded. We agreed with that in principle. I also said to the court, however, in the state's motion, it broadly claims that there are no raised geste statements that uh, would be admissible. And I objected and I said, yes, I think there are some raised geste statements that may be admissible. And I want an opportunity to address those with the court uh, prior to the beginning of the trial. And the court did not disagree with that. No one disagreed with that. And I wanted to be sure at that time that all of the characterized as hearsay statements, characterized as self-serving statements, didn't get lumped all into the same basket because they are very different. And at the bench, I guess yesterday or sometime prior to today, I reminded the court that I wanted to address that part of that motion. And that's why we're here today. In fact, yesterday I said to the court, if I may be specific about why um, we're here on that aspect of the motion. And I'm able to, to, I'm able to advise the court specifically this morning what I'm talking about when I say there are raised just day statements that are not excludable under the general uh, sweeping statement of the state in its motion. Let me interrupt you for just one moment. <clears throat> I don't know if you have given those statements to the state that you intend to argue about today, but I think it's only fair that before either side brings something up for a ruling by the court that they inform the other side so they're prepared. I have not received any motion um, regarding um, the, the specific rest just statements that you're uh, seeking a ruling on. So I haven't had an opportunity to, to look at that either, but more importantly, the other side hasn't had that opportunity. So if, if you want to, to um, have a short conference with the state, tell them what they are. If there's no objection, fine. If there's an objection, I will hear it. But I think they need to know before you present it to me what it is that you're, you're seeking. So feel free to go talk to them. Should we do that? Okay. Should we do that now? Yeah. I'll just I'll wait. Well, I don't know who's going to meet with Mr. West, so why don't we wait just a moment? Sure. I can meet with Mr. West, or well, what? What? Where are those statements? He has like that. Share with you, of course. Yeah. If you're talking, I'd like to be able to look at it and analyze it, not just. Well, you may be familiar. You may be familiar with it, so. I understand, but you've had a, an opportunity. Okay, why don't you go back into the one of the witness rooms? <clears throat> Is um, <coughs> Mr. Guy and Mr. Man Man time? Probably. Yeah. yeah, I think we're available, Judge, for what's next. Okay, what's next? I had, um, as you know, have a motion for sanctions pending with the court that you had in effect deferred ruling on until after trial. Uh, not to belabor it, the issue was, and I think the evidence is unrebutted, that the state had in its possession no later than January of, two th of the 2013 uh, a a report and several um, supplement reports that went with it, Excel spreadsheets that was um, given to them by one of their employees and they had that information available and you heard the testimony concerning all of that. You've, re you've sort of reserved on the sanctions um, thinking that the only thing that I had sought or, or that the only thing I had sought was financial. Um, I, as I mentioned to you back then, I'm seeking additional sanctions, and the sanction, in effect, that I'm asking the court to consider today is this. 
had I had that information in January, and again, remember, I had some of it because we were doing some work and caught tips of the iceberg to know that there was more there, but had no idea what the state had. Of course, they had a lot more than we did. But had I had that information back then, rather than spending all the time it took to get it and then to let Just it... Just get to the point. What, okay. what is it well, that you're asking? The, yeah, the reason why I mentioned the time is not for sympathy, but I have not had the time to go out and do all of the work that would be necessary to get the what authentication, is it that you're for? the authentication of that information. So, to the extent that they kept it from me, and thereby have prejudiced me in my preparation of that evidence, I'm. What are you asking for? I'm asking for a relaxation of the authentication rules. If it, if it was on Trayvon Martin's phone, and I showed that it was on Trayvon Martin's phone. It comes into evidence as the only basis for foundation for authentication without having to do anything else but that. Response. Well, Judge, I will point out, number one, that I disagree with Mr. Romero's representation that anything about that whole episode was unrebutted or unchallenged or accepted. Uh, number two, I don't know that we established that the documents or things that we're talking about are in any way report. It sounded believe more like it was a, a work product matter that was brought to people's attention, irrespective of what label we put on it. As far as what to do, um, tossing out the rules of evidence, I think, is generally a bad idea. Um, as far as authenticating what is on the phone, I'm not sure what the point is in saying just because it's on a phone, I therefore believe it should be admitted into evidence. There are myriad other barriers to the introduction of such evidence. The only request, I think the court properly originally noted, in the actual motion for sanctions uh, was for monetary relief. And I think it still is the only written request in any written motion uh, is for monetary relief. And I think the court has already ruled on that matter. You've decided when and how you wish to address it. And it shouldn't cause the evidence code to evaporate during the course of this trial. So that would be the state's position. Brief response. Brief response. I'm not suggesting that we toss the evidence field. I am suggesting that the state be responsible for its actions or inactions to the extent that it, it of course, it would still have to be relevant to evidence. We, we're not going to ignore anything. My only concern is this. To the extent that the court believes that I, by my presentation, may have been prejudiced by their failure to give us the information when they should have, and to the extent that it has caused me problems with getting ready for the authentication of it. I just want you to get to the point. I understand what your concerns are. Okay. If it's otherwise rel re relevant evidence, otherwise admissible, I should not be held to the strict standard of otherwise authentication. Okay. I'm document. not going to make a, a, a general ruling relaxing the rules of evidence um, and the authentication requirement because for several reasons, but one reason is I have no idea what the state intends to introduce. And we could take it up one at a time as to what they want to introduce because I'm sure there are other objections that may be raised by both sides and I'll take the th authentication issue up with the other objections. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there another matter before we get back to? We don't want to be too informal. Can I have a moment to look at the list? Yes. That we come up mm -hmm. with Is, and you're is, aware of the motion? Yes, I didn't know who was arguing that on behalf of the state. Okay, then you may proceed. Oh, I, I, I stand Mr. By Guy? My, yeah, I, I okay. think you understand my position. I'll respond to him if it's appropriate. Thank you. Mr. Guy? Your Honor, none of the terms um, listed by the defense are prohibited by any case law that the state can find. There were a couple of cases cited by the state but dealt with First of all, closing arguments in very, very different terminology. I don't know if the court had an opportunity to review those, Perez and uh, Goddard. Yes. Okay. Um, but just, if I can address these just for a moment. Uh, number one, they're asking us to prohibit the use of the word profiled. Um, and, I, and I understand from the content of the remainder of their motion that they believe we are going to frame that that the defendant racially profiled Trayvon Mard, but I would submit to the court there are a number of ways a person can be profiled. They can be profiled by their age, their dress, 
the car that they drive, the location and timing that, are, that they're in a certain place. Um, so that is not a racially charged term unless it's made so, and we don't intend to make it a racially charged term. Okay, so you're saying that you will not use um, r race in the um, use of the term profiled? Not, not exclusively, not exclusively. I, again, uh, there, there are a number of avenues that someone can be profiled in any one or in combination. So, um, but we don't intend to say that he was uh, solely profiled because of race. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Judge, the next three, uh, vigilante, self-appointed neighborhood watch captain, and wannabe cop, again, there's nothing uh, prejudicial about any of those terms. They're not racially charged. Um, there's no case law that prohibits the use of any of those terms. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, I believe it would be incorrect to say he's the self-appointed neighborhood watch captain. He, he initiated the neighborhood watch program for their treat at Twin Lakes, and then he was later appointed the captain. So I agree. Um, again, I don't think it's improper if it was a fact, but I don't believe it is a fact that he was the self-appointed uh, neighborhood watch so captain. What you're saying in regard to that um, statement that you would not be using it in that regard as self-appointed neighborhood watch captain, what you would be using is that he was part of the uh, neighborhood watch and was appointed the captain, but he did initiate the entire program into the neighborhood. So there's yeah. a, I don't, there, I don't know there'd if There'd be no a, objection to that. That's argument, but he didn't. So here, here well, I want him to finish and okay. give you my response generally, but. The next one? Judge, on those three terms, that's, that's my position. Okay. Um, he got out of the car after the police told him not to do so. I'm not quite sure if they're meeting, they got that in quotes, so I'm assuming that's exactly what they mean. Uh, the facts are that he was told not to follow anyone uh, specifically, he was asked, are you following anyone? He said, yes. The dispatcher said, we don't need you to do that. That conversation happened after he was out of the car. So again, this factually is incorrect, and I would agree with that it's factually incorrect. Um, but if they're asking us not to say that he was told not to follow anyone, that I would object to. Okay. Um, and the last one, uh, he, contr he confronted Trayvon Martin. That's the state's theory of the case, and we believe we have evidence to support that. Again, that is just a fact. Uh, that we believe exists, so we would ask to uh, not to be precluded from using that terminology. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. O'Mara. Thank you. I know that we're on delicate ground when you're telling lawyers how to use their words, and I mean that. The problem that I have is that we have tried to date to be very cautious with the case, realizing the nature of the case. Opening statements are supposed to be an outline of evidence. We have had in recent history in this Central Florida area an absurdity of how to handle an opening statement where information was presented that never came into court. And I thought that was problematic when I first heard it. I don't want to happen in this case, and I don't intend to have an opening statement on the defense side that does not bring out evidence that we have a reasonable basis to believe is coming in. I think that's the standard. So I, I reference those concerns for a couple of reasons. The term profiling, when it was addressed at an April 20th hearing before this court's involvement, where I asked the state attorney's office investigator what exactly they meant by that word, uh, it was quite apparent that when you use the word profiling, it's like peanut butter and jelly, profiling and racial, in a case of this magnitude, and the focus that this case has had for the past 15 months. So I'm very very concerned that we now infect potentially a jury with a racial component that is not going to show up in facts. That's one concern. The idea of the vigilante. Look, if a witness says vigilante, I think the state can show it in closing. My concern is I don't want an infection of this jury with evidence that is, with suggested evidence, that's not going to become actual evidence. Uh, let, let me ask you this, because most cases in opening statement, whatever the attorneys say is not evidence, and they're giving an overview of what they believe that they're going to be able to prove. And if they don't prove it, it they have to deal with that. Um, oftentimes in opening, the state will say we're going to prove A, B, C. They don't do it, and in closing, the defense attorney says, do you remember an opening? 
Do you remember an opening? The state promised you A, B, and C, and they have not brought forth any evidence to that, and they use it to their benefit. Uh, why should this be any different? I understand that there is case law out there that suggests that the term racial profiling alone um, uh, may is a close call and may not, and probably should not be used. But with with other things that words that they may say or or suggestions they may make, if they don't prove it, they don't prove it, and you'll bring it to that jury's attention in a closing argument. And I understand that that is a safety valve for my response. My concern and the reason why I addressed it and new matters happen in this case that have ever happened before in my career. I don't think I've ever filed a motion to restrict the state in opening statements, but I just want to be very, very cautious that if we go down a path in an opening statement and then we have to respond to that path in our opening statement that we brought to this jury information that they're never going to see in a courtroom. I'll give you a real easy example, then I'll sit down. I don't know what the state's going to say, right? But I know the evidence is, with, is indisputable that Mrs. Zimmerman was out of the car when the dispatch said to him, hey, you following him? Oh, we don't need you to do that. And Mrs. Zimmerman says, okay. Now, there'll be interpretations, but were the state to say, now they're saying they won't, that he got out of the car to follow him or got out of the car after they told him not to, which we know no evidence supports, that's a concern that I have, because that does plant a seed that may not be able to be unrung in a jury's mind. That's why I'm being particularly cautious. We have tried so hard in this case not to make it what everybody outside the courthouse may want it to be. And well, just being don't you think that the, neither side wants, wants that to happen and to have those kind of errors occur um, in the trial? Uh, well, my I, 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 would, I would say, um, I would ask the state to say, stay away from racial profiling, but not the word profiled itself if it's used in other terms. Um, term vigilante usually would be used during a closing argument, but if that's something that they want to do in their opening, I'm not going to prohibit that. The self-appointed neighborhood watch captain, um, with the, the, the state had indicated that that um, statement that you have in quotes, that they agreed that that's not what had happened, um, that he had initiated the neighborhood watch program and was appointed captain and may have had the involvement and that's the way that they're going to use it. Uh, Want to be cop? I think that that's appropriate. Um, the state has acknowledged that your quote, he got out of the car after the police or dispatcher told him not to, was factually incorrect and they can state the factually correct statement. Um, he confronted Trayvon Martin, that statement. That is the state's case, um, and so they will be allowed to do that. So I think that that's the ruling on all of those. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I see that Mr. West is back, but Mr. De La Ronda is still out there, so we'll wait a few moments. Was there another motion? There's not necessarily a motion, but just a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, in, in getting with the defense, we have already agreed upon the admissibility and relevance of a number of uh, items of evidence over a hundred so far and we still have some work to do my question for the court is may we pre-mark those exhibits by number um, so that we don't have to interrupt the trial by identifying as a letter and then approaching the clerk and have her mark it as a number I mean that's okay um, generally those that are stipulated to can be by a number um, those that are not need to be a letter Correct. for identification need to be a letter you may want to get with um, Sarah and she'll give you the stickers that that we would use and uh yes ma'am we're working on that, that. i talked to the clerk that was here yesterday i apologize mm -hmm. i don't remember her name but we talked about that um yesterday and it was some trouble about getting those but perhaps with the, the court's instruction we can, we can, can do can that they? okay i'm sorry you know what the court just said she said if i ordered that they give you Great. the stickers that she could give it to you so yeah there's a chance of getting them today then we spend the weekend on it and Judge, we'll have an evidence list for the court with all the exhibits and the numbers and so forth. And anything that's not numbered, we will, of course, have a corresponding letter. Okay. Judge, also, just as another housekeeping matter, I would ask, um, just for the sake of the jury, that when they're seated, I don't know what the court's practice would be, and I would ask that they be ser uh, seated in the first two rows, 5D. The, the, all these other chairs are going to be taken away. The uh, tables will be turned back around. Of course. The but when you seat the jury, rather than seat them the length of the box, I would ask that they be just two by two. Five deep so that they're closer to the witness stand and have five a better, deep. 
No, no, no. I'm, I'm sorry. This way. Okay. This across. Way. Right, but not not eight across as they are. You know, as, as opposed to eight and two, I'd rather have five and five, yeah. just so they're closer to the witness and have a better opportunity to observe uh, the witness. No objection. No. We'll do that. Okay. Is your housekeeping list checked off now? I believe so. Thank you. We're going to leave the tables this way for trial. No, they're going to be back regular courtroom style. But I'd ask. Okay. Um, Mr. De La Ronda, did you and Mr. West have an opportunity to go back and talk about the specific? We did, Your Honor. Mr. West decided to me two particular witnesses and two particular statements that uh, they intend to uh, introduce. And I told Mr. West, uh, I did meet with him, and he cited the two specific statements. Um, I want to have an opportunity to read the entire or analyze the entire statements, both statements in the context in which they were said, and uh, determine whether they can establish this or not in terms of just for rest just side, there's eight different ones. They haven't cited which specific one they want to rely on specifically. These are self-serving statements by the defendant. Normally, they're not admissible. They're citing an exception. Without arguing the whole motion again, now it's to that specific point. We'd like to have an opportunity to review it, and I told them I would be glad to do it this weekend. Okay. Uh, I'd like to be heard specifically on that issue so that the court... On having, have giving him the opportunity to review it this weekend? No, on uh, directing the court's attention to the issue and um, the relevant case law. Okay. And, I don't, I'm and, not going to hear it until he has an opportunity to review it. That was the whole purpose of this morning. Your Honor, it's his motion. It's his motion to exclude the raised just day statements. Without the, I'm sorry. Without articulating which ones. I don't states, know which ones. You're asking me to uh, make a ruling in a vacuum. No, here's the one. Here, here's, here's what they are. I want them in um, writing. They are in writing in Mr. Delavion's I don't. Hand. I don't have them. Please listen to what I'm saying. I can't make a ruling in a vacuum. You need to provide to me that which you want to have heard. I've asked that you provide it to Mr. De La Ronda and you have done so today. He's requesting that he have at least this weekend to review the entire statement to take it into context and we could take it up later. I still don't have, it, have what you're asking about and I'm not prepared to do an order on something that a motion is not in writing as to what you're seeking to have introduced. I've already issued an order that granted the state's motion. I'm allowing you the opportunity to present these other matters to me, but I'm not going to do it without having something in writing. So. How can I assist the court then? If I, if I file a, a pleading or provide something to the court that identifies the statements? That would assist me. Okay. Then I'd have something that I can look at. I'm happy to do that right now orally so the court has an idea of what we're talking about. These are state's witnesses. Um, Mr. De La Ronda okay. knows all the witnesses okay. and what I will said. hear this at a later time. May we? Um, could we have the matter heard either later today? Uh, that would be fine. Or before. Okay. Um, if you want my in. fry order today, I can't sit here in court all day. I have ha I have all the witnesses, four days of testimony, and I've reviewed them till late last night. I've got to sit down and write that order. If you want the order today, then I cannot come back into court this afternoon. Like I told you yesterday, if I don't get that order finished today, that means I will finish it over the weekend. You will not be able to get it till Monday. That's just the logistics of how the court works. I'm not going to be here in the building, and I have no means to get that order to you on Saturday or Sunday, so you would not be able to get it until Monday morning. That's the best I can do. I'm also telling you I don't want to rule in a vacuum on this motion that you now want to bring before me. I need it in writing. I have been very good in giving everybody whatever time they need to get whatever heard. I have been here on Saturdays. I've been here on the evenings. I will continue to do so. My time will be provided to you to hear it. All I'm asking for is something in writing so I can review before we have to hear. I'm not going to hear that now. You can provide it in writing. You've given it to Mr. De La Ronda. Is there any other motions? 
today that the court has before it that you think has not been ruled upon that needs to be addressed? We, we can provide email addresses or fax numbers so that the court could... I don't have fax things, a fax machine at my home. I'm sorry to disclose that on national TV, but I do not have a fax machine at home. Um, one and other, One other thing, that if the court has made a decision, if we know what the decision is on the admissibility of the fry, uh, on the fry issue, we don't need the order now. We just need to know what the decision is and we can move forward. Okay. I'm very comfortable doing things the way that I'm used to doing them, and that's by, on, on in a matter that has taken over four days to hear, and I've had to organize my notes to sit down and get my thoughts together and put it in writing, and that's how I choose to do it this time. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other housekeeping matters that we need to take care of um, today? None from the state, from I the just defense. I'm going to and ask another question informally, but I am just want to make sure since this is our last time with you until Monday morning, if there's anything else that I want to go over. Thank you. We've got a bunch of depositions set for this weekend. Hopefully we'll get them done, and, and we'll see you Monday. Okay. Yes. There was one other matter, um, and I only ask because I see it sitting here with the clerk at this point in time. Um, Mr. West did, yesterday after the court recessed from the Fry hearing, wish to file an exhibit. Uh, he provided me a copy of the exhibit at that time, and I notified the clerk that I was objecting to significant portions of it. It's subdivided into parts A through S. See, and I you're think. wanting me to give an oral ruling, but you're also wanting me to accept new exhibits for the Fry hearing that look to be about two inches thick. Um, so, I, much of it is is already in evidence, and about half of it was attempted to be offered and objected to and not admitted okay. and so that is why I bring it up and I, again I bring it up only because I see it sitting there and I didn't think it should go unremarked. Okay I, I, I thought we were finished with the Fry hearing so apparently we're not. Your Honor, I indicated that I thought it might assist the court if I prepared an exhibit that was sort of a compilation of the CVs and the reports that had been provided to the court not knowing whether the court has filed the reports with the clerk. So I don't know if they were of record or not. So I have an exhibit, it's a composite exhibit, that contains these things. The um, curriculum vitae of George Donington, Peter French, Harry Holine, Hiro Taka Nakasone, Tom Owen, and Alan Reich. It also contains the reports that were prepared by Harry Holine and James Harnsberger. Let me start you right, stop you right there. Mr. Hol Holine and Mr. Harnsberger did not testify at the hearing. So what is the relevance of the court reviewing their reports and their CV? I have to take into consideration. I have to take into consideration for the purposes of the Fry hearing of the testimony and evidence presented during that hearing? The, a specific reason is this, that um, they were, doctors Holine and Harnsberger were identified in listed witnesses and the state provided their report to the court for review on the Fry hearing. And since the state has the uh, burden of proof on the Fry hearing, they either intended to offer Dr. Holine's testimony as to his report, which they changed their mind, or him, I guess, as an expert on the community. Regardless, the court has received it and reviewed it, and my argument yesterday was that none of the state's experts agree as to what the content of Let the report is. Let me tell you there. The court is only going to consider that which was introduced into evidence either by testimony or exhibits at the Fry hearing itself. I am not going to consider anything else. So to, to the extent that you're concerned that that information may have been provided to the court, the court is not considering it if it hasn't been part of the hearing. Let me, um, I understand the court's ruling. May I? May I just mark the exhibit for the record? Uh, absolutely. It will be um, a letter, and I don't know which letter we're up to. It's uh, H, H. Okay. and 
may I identify what else is in the composite exhibit? Yes, you may. And there may be specific objections the state has that we could agree. Um, well, they, they they can object to a to a uh, for identification because it's not being admitted. Some of it is already in evidence, so that would be marked separately. If the court has marked the CVs and the reports separately to introduce them into evidence. There are um, CVs that are admitted into evidence. Um, Dr. Holines and Harnsberger are not amongst them. Is Dr. Um, Owen's report in evidence? And uh, Dr. Reich's reports in evidence? I believe that they are. Um, I have to go here and I don't have that file here with me, but let me. Well, I have all of this here in the composite. I'll tender it to the, to the clerk. The court can, re can review whatever it finds to be relevant to the proceedings. Uh, the court is aware, of course, Ramirez says that the court should look at all areas of information in reviewing whether or not the uh, methodologies are within the accepted community or accepted within the community. There was a reference to a YouTube video that um, was not played yesterday. It was Mr. Owen explaining his procedure on national television. That's on this disc, and the court may or may not decide to watch it. That's what that was. There, um, on the, the CD is the non-emergency call that Mr. Zimmerman made that is the subject of Dr. Reich's report specifically. There are the um, call by witness 11 that has the screams in the background that was played. That's on here if the court wants to review that. The both redacted and unredacted. The recordings that Mr. Owen used in his analysis where he looped the uh, sample is on here and the um, exemplar that he talked about is on here. Those were provided by the state. There are two cases that don't need to be here because the court knows about them, Ramirez and Fry. I don't know how they wound up in the composite exhibit. And then there are the various articles that we talked about. Um, the article called Forensic Speaker Recognition, the one called When to Punt, which is a distillation of the presentation through a PowerPoint. Um, Dr. Doddington's article that he talked about when he was doing research and publishing in this area is here, um, and some of Dr. Wayman's materials. So that's what this is. For whatever use the court has of it, um, I would offer it. It's Defendant's uh, H Composite. Thank you very much. And the court will take possession of the um, for identification. Just so you know, um, in evidence um, is State's Exhibit 1 is the CV of Tom Owen. State's Exhibit 2 is the CV of Dr. Alan Wright. Defense Exhibit 1 is the CV of Dr. Hirotaka Nabasoni. Um, State's uh, Defense Exhibit 2 is the CV of Dr. French. And Defense Exhibit 3 is the CV of Dr. Doddington. Admitted, um, I, I know there were others there, I just don't have that on that page. But it, um, for identification purposes, is Defense Exhibit A, copy easy voice graph of 911 calls. Exhibit B is copy easy voice chart of 911 calls. Exhibit C is the color copy of easy voice graph chart 911 calls. Do you have the additional exhibit list, Sarah? Because I know there were more. Which date was that one? That one was, this one is from June 6th and 7th. Well, what happened to EFG? They're all here. D, E, F, and G are here, but not entered in 
Right. If you want to look at those, you'll know what's in evidence. Yes? Your Honor, the, the court asked counsel to provide all the reports, and those should be part of the record. The court received them and reviewed them as part of these proceedings. It, I would ask the court to okay. take... There's, there's a big difference when, when the court is the one who's making the decision as opposed to the jury. There are things that may be admitted um, for identification purposes that the jury would never see. And the parties may hand to the court, even in open court, certain documents that are never admitted into evidence. And part of the role of a judge is to be able to separate that which is admissible and that which isn't admissible. So I have told you that what this court is going to consider in, in rendering its decision in the Fry case is the testimony and evidence presented in, in the case entered into evidence by both sides. I am not going to consider things that have not been presented to me in open court. And we would ask that the court enter into evidence the reports of the experts of uh, Dr. Reich that were talked about extensively. There are two of them that the court has received and reviewed and the uh, materials that have been provided, the, um, which includes all the CVs, all of the reports, Okay, and the we're, we're running in circles here. I have told you what is already in evidence and what I determine I need to consider. That's all I want to hear on this issue. Thank you, Your Honor. Unless you had something you wanted to put in as an exhibit. No. no. Okay. Is there anything else? Because I'm here and well, happy to clear up anything else that you may have that you think needs a decision by this court today. Um, do I hear anything else from either side? Not on behalf of the state. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll see you all on Monday.